All right, I'm going to get started. Let me just quickly uh, share my video so you guys can uh, see me. Hello. There, thanks for coming. I'm just going to shut this down and we'll all fo and we can focus on the, the slides where all the good information is. Um, so this was a, a next steps, a, an offshoot from our Starting Good Summit, which we wrote recently. And its real goal is to help provide the basics that anyone would need in order to begin to build and design a crowdfunding campaign for their social impact venture. Avoiding the missteps that lead to so much failure and identifying the key areas. I mean, you won't get all the questions, you know, you won't, you won't come out of today with a fully fleshed out plan. We haven't got time for that, but you'll know the questions to ask. You'll know where you need to focus and you'll know uh, where to apply yourself in order to create that brilliant crowdfunding campaign that will help you raise the funds you need to really make an impact in the world. My name's Tom, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Start Some Good. Prior to Start Some Good, I'd founded or co-founded three prior not-for-profits on a previous social enterprise. So I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a starter-upper of things. And so I've, I've been through the journey of, of having to like pitch a new idea and build a team and raise money over and over again. And our mission at Start Some Good is to make that journey a little bit easier for innovators and social entrepreneurs in order to create a more innovative social sector so that we can de develop and design and scale solutions at the pace of change of the world today. So let's dive into it. Crowdfunding is a really exciting new area and we're seeing a lot of great projects successfully raise the funds they need through crowdfunding. And particularly for us, we, we started with a mission, as I said, to support more innovation in the social sector, which is something we really believe that we, we are lacking and something that often the traditional funding bodies are not well set up to support or not inclined to support. They want to support things that have evidence that they already work, which is fantastic. But how do we get that evidence? Often we need to raise enough money to launch, to pilot, to prove our model before we can gain access to those better funds. And so over the last five years, it starts some good. We've helped about 1,500 projects raise more than $10 million to do that. And we're proud to say that we've helped a lot of really interesting early stage projects. And just to touch, this is barely touches the scratches the surface of the people we've worked with, but some of the projects that we're proud of include the first open source mapping startup in Kathmandu, the first speech therapy uh, organization in Cambodia, the first social enterprise food truck in Myanmar. Uh, speaking of uh, social enterprise food trucks, this is our most successful project in Australia to date, the food justice truck launched by the Asylum Seeker Resource Center. We've worked with some great technology projects such as Right Near Me, which helps people share food supply, um, available food more efficiently so that less goes to waste. Lots of social enterprise startups, such as Word with, Words With Heart, a feminist stationery company, or One Night Stand, a sleepwear label, whose profits go towards homeless uh, to get kids off the street. Um, and indeed, the original social enterprises, cooperatives, this is the biggest cooperative crowdfunding campaign in Australia today, to take over a shutdown uh, car factory and use it as a, and open, reopen it as a cooperative, creating next generation of hot water heaters. Very cool. Um, and this is a school initiated by the indigenous community in, in Cape York and a great example of how crowdfunding really gives the tools d down into the community level so the communities can construct their, create their own projects and can rally the resources they need to really implement solutions for themselves without always having to wait for the government or even a big foundation or, or, or funder to sign off on that for them. That they, this really empowers local communities to make a difference. But what I've just done is what everyone does when they talk about crowdfunding. And it's a little bit of a trap. I've just shared nothing but success stories. And that's what everyone wants to do when they talk about crowdfunding, of course, because success stories are really exciting and inspiring, and of course we're proud to share them. But one of the dangers of crowdfunding, or not so much a danger, but I think something that, that sends a lot of people down the wrong track is that it's possible to see only successes. You know, almost by definition, Success in crowdfunding is very loud and failure is very quiet. And so if it's, it's not uncommon for not perhaps 90% of all the crowdfunding campaigns you've ever seen. 100% of the crowdfunding campaigns I just showed you are successes, but that is not the norm. This is an article in Entrepreneur Magazine last year, banner headline, less than a third of crowdfunding campaigns reach their goal. And that's true. And it's actually much less than a third overall. This is the graph they shared in Entrepreneur Magazine I've taken the liberty of adding Start Some Good to it. We weren't originally there. 
but I think it's a you know it's a it's a it's a, <laughs> a, a pleasing comparison for it to be there. But you'll really see that of the of the, the platforms they surveyed, none of them even reached the third. The closest was Kickstarter at thirty one percent, right down to Indiegogo at thirteen percent and Rocket Hub at eleven percent. And hidden within this graph is a story of different crowdfunding methodologies or approaches and those that work better and those that work worse. Those bottom three platforms you see there, all under 20% success rate, are all keep what you raise platforms. And that's not a coincidence. Um, keep what you raise approaches to crowdfunding have woeful success rates, but they sound really attractive. And so I think keep what you raise is really a trap for inexperienced players. Because of course, if you're asked, do you want to keep what you raise? Your answer is yes. I mean, who doesn't want to keep what they've raised? But what you may not realize is that by choosing keep what you raise, it's making it harder for you to actually raise anything. Whereas the other platforms, Start Some Good Included, use what's called a, an all or nothing me methodology, which means that you set a goal and you're accountable to that goal. You have to reach that goal or you don't receive the funds that are pledged. Now, obviously, that sounds scary and it has with it the possibility that you might end up on nothing, you know, raising no money, which would be a bummer but it does make it much easier to convert new donors. And it is not a coincidence at all that all of the higher success rates on this graph are those platforms that use an all or nothing method. And we're gonna talk more about this as we go through it and why that is. But most simply, it comes down to understanding the role that risk plays and how to make your campaign feel less risky for your potential supporters. But before we go any further, <coughs> excuse me, Let's talk about some basic misconceptions that people often have about crowdfunding. And I think these misconceptions are at the heart of why there is such a, such a poor success rate overall. And honestly, at the heart of why we have uh, such a high success rate comparatively as well. We don't have like better technology. We don't have thousands of people just waiting around to shower your project with money. No one does, I'm afraid. We're gonna talk about that more in a second. Um, but what we do do and what we really commit ourselves to is just making sure that everyone who's building projects on our site understands how crowdfunding works, is briefed on the work involved, on the fact, on, on the importance of having an outreach plan, of thinking through who your potential supporters are and of designing a story that will inspire them to support you. Um, and we provide custom feedback and collaborative support as you're designing your campaign as well. And that's why we're able to, we're one of the only platforms in the world with more successes than failures, which we're really proud of. So what are some of the key misunderstandings about crowdfunding? Well, the first I think is the idea that it's something that's brand new. It, it is a new, a new phrase, a new word. The, the word crowdfunding is probably about 10 years old, maybe not even quite that old. And it's easy to believe that because we've got a new word, that what's happening is itself a completely new thing. But that's simply not the case. Crowdfunding is still a form of fundraising. And so all the old rules apply. And what are, what are the rules of fundraising? Well, successful fundraising means having a compelling story, getting that story to the right people, and making it easy for them to contribute and share. And so what crowdfunding has really done is played with that last stage. It's changed the way in which people contribute and share, making that easier, more scalable, and more game-like. So that's awesome. But you can't, you can't take advantage of that if you ignore the first two parts of that equation having a compelling story and figuring out who to tell it to. And then of course, actually doing the work to get that story to them. And so crowdfunding is just fundraising and fundraising is old. You know, crowdfunding um, at its most simple definition is the aggregation of multiple small contributions from numerous um, contributors, no one of whom could individually have supported that project or initiative. In many ways, that's as old as tithing. That's almost as old as human, his as, as human history. But even in its modern incarnation of a civic project with an all or nothing barrier to completion, it's not new. One of my favorite examples from the past is the Statue of Liberty, which you see here. This is the statue being built in the suburbs of Paris, but as you probably know, it was then gifted to the people of America and specifically to the city of New York. The problem was the city of New York itself, as in the government, didn't really want to pay to install the statue. If you've ever been to Ellis Island, that big hunk of concrete that Lady Liberty is standing on, that's what we're talking about. Those things don't pour themselves. Someone needs to pay for them. And the city didn't want to. And then the high society who would normally pay for such things wouldn't chip in either. And so in desperation, Joseph Pulitzer put this ad in his newspaper. What shall be done with the great Bartholdi statue? And asked for, you know, how, co how Congress has, has failed to pay for it. 
the city has failed to pay for it. If we want it, we're going to have to pay for it ourselves. And sure enough, they raised $100,000 from 120,000 contributors who averaged 84 cents each. That's why the Statue of Liberty is in New York today, because it was crowdfunded. Little known fact. But that's exactly how crowdfunding campaigns still work. You know, that dynamic is still what's going on here. That there was a specific project. It had an all or nothing goal. You can't build half the pedestal. You can't build three quarters of the pedestal. You need the whole pedestal or bust. And then they had a delivery mechanism, which was the newspaper. They had a, a way to receive the funds, which back then was the postal system. And they ultimately were successful in reaching their goal. And so those core rules, what's, what's the same about crowdfunding and previous forms of fundraising, more important than what's different. You've got to have that great story and you've got to think really carefully about how you're going to get it. Secondly, it's not automatic. A lot of people imagine that crowdfunding works a little bit like the way Airbnb works, which is, or the eBay works, or even Uber, which is that you create a listing and then the platform is simply responsible for channeling demand in your direction and you simply have to respond to that demand. But the demand is in a way automatic. It's generated by the platform itself. And your job is just to A, create a good listing, and then B, respond to the demand that emerges. Very few people who put their spare bed or their holiday house up on Airbnb think very deeply about what is my marketing strategy to drive attention to this listing, who are my preferred potential uh, you know, hirers, etc. They leave that up to Airbnb. That's what's called, Airbnb is what's called a two-sided marketplace. And they're a very popular business model today. Airbnb, Uber, uh, eBay, anything. And, and a two-sided so two marketplace is where the platform is responsible for both halves of the market. Crowdfunding kind of looks and feels like that. You see both halves of the market there. There are people raising funds, there are people contributing funds. But the dynamic is completely different from that in a two-sided marketplace. The platform is not responsible for driving your donors. And that's true for, not just true for Start Some Good, that's true for all platforms. Um, today and so it's really important that you realize that that's your responsibility and your opportunity um, to figure out who your donors are going to be uh, and I, I was reminded of this when I saw the founder of Kickstarter um, speak at a conference not very long ago and in the Q&A section someone asked him what's the value of being the featured project on the Kickstarter homepage so you'd imagine if ever kind of the two-sided marketplace thing was going to work for you. If ever it wasn't going to rest on your own hard work and hustle, it was if you were featured on the Kickstarter homepage, right? Because we know thousands of people use Kickstarter, people raise millions of dollars, so to be featured in front of all those people will surely just take care of your project for you. And his answer was actually uh, interesting. His answer was that the value is approximately zero. That donors, that donors don't come through the homepage at all. Donors come through, donors land on individual campaign pages and they land there because they've been driven there by the outreach and storytelling of the person whose project it is. That they have found, they have figured out who their donors are and they've figured out how to reach them and those donors then come in to the, onto their project, not through the homepage. Very few people get up in the morning and think to themselves, I'm just going to go find something cool to give money to today. Some people do that, but very few far too few for you to rely on them. Instead, what you can rely on is your own hard work and focus in building your community. Um, Bernard, I see you're raising your hand. Do you think you could add your question into the chat box so I can have a look at it um, and incorporate my answer um, without slowing down my flow? Um, thanks so much. And then finally, crowdfunding is not about crowds at all. It'd be nice if it was. It'd be cool if there was just a crowd out there lurking online, waiting to shower funds onto, onto deserving projects. But there's not. And so we, you know, we think crowdfunding is very badly named. We actually resisted for the first 18 months or something to start some goods life. We didn't have the word crowdfunding anywhere on the site. We refused to call what we were doing crowdfunding. We insisted that it was called peer funding. But obviously that linguistic horse has bolted and we have to call it what everyone else calls it or else no one knows what we're talking about. So crowdfunding. And, but it, and it doesn't really matter what you call it. It matters that you understand how it works. And so as long as you understand that crowdfunding is not about crowds, you'll be okay. What is crowdfunding about? Crowdfunding is about teams. In other words, not an anonymous mass of individuals, but a small collection of people who all share the same goals and are pulling in the same direction. Crowdfunding is more participatory 
than other other uh, methods of fundraising. It encourages people to do more than just give. It encourages them to advocate on behalf of the projects they care about as well, especially in the case of all or nothing crowdfunding. Because in all or nothing crowdfunding, if you don't advocate for it and if you don't help it reach its goals, they won't receive your funds anyway and the project won't go ahead. And so your responsibility is very clear. And so another way of talking about this is it's about building community, which is a much more intimate concept and a much more conscious concept than crowd. And so as I said earlier, part of when you're building community, when you're inviting people to be part of a team, you need to think about what's in it for them. So your job as a fundraiser is not just to think about you and your needs. You know, you know why you need money. That's really clear. But you actually have to think really carefully about why will people give you money and why won't they? And the main reason they won't is because of their perception of risk. Sorry, I'm, I'm a slide ahead. What I meant to say here is that you don't think about crowdfunding platforms as the source of your supporters. Think about them as the set of tools you will use to rally those supporters. In some ways, it's a bit like if you launch a blog. You know, lots of great blogging platforms. That's all the software you need. You don't need any technical skills. Uh, the blog will scale infinitely, irrespective of the amount of traffic you get. All the infrastructure's there but you don't have any readers automatically unless you actually get out there and introduce your blog to people. Otherwise, it's just words on a screen and you're the only one who can see them. So as I was saying, the key thing that you need to overcome and the, the, the key thing that holds donors back from giving is their sense of risk, essentially. I mean, actually, the bigger thing is that they never hear about it at all, to be honest. You know, the, the main reason people won't support your campaign is because they didn't, even, they didn't hear about it, they didn't even know it was there. So once again, that comes down to your outreach. But for the people that do become aware of it, who do come and check it out, but then who don't support you, it'll prim primarily be because it feels too risky for them in one way or another. And so there are three types of risk that we want you to think about. The first is idea risk. Is this a good idea? Do I believe in this? W will it even work? Do I think it's sensible? Do I want it to happen? Obviously that's really important, but for a lot of people crowdfunding, that's where they put all their attention. They think the entire name of the game is to convince people that their idea is a good idea. And that if people agree with the idea, i.e. I want this to happen, I hope that this, you know, this would be a positive for the world, they think that's enough to then have those people contribute funds. But that's simply not the case. I think an even bigger hurdle for a lot of people in terms of risk is not idea risk. You know, okay, sounds cool, I'm on board, I agree, I want it to happen. But then Implementation risk. Do I believe that you're the right person to make it happen? I think the idea is great, but who are you? And are you any good at implementing ideas, even if they're good ones? How do I know I can put my, my faith in you and my money in you, what's more, that you will spend it in the right way and create the kinds of outcomes that you're telling us about? And I think that's actually the bigger barrier than the first one, but the one that people often spend less time on. And so we really encourage people that it's so important to introduce yourself through your crowdfunding campaign, to share your credentials and to demonstrate as much progress and as much of your work already as possible. So it's not just an idea. It, there's evidence, there's momentum, there's a thing that's already happening that people can be part of. And then the third one, which is really important and comes back to this choice of crowdfunding models that you choose, is fundraising risk. And so this is particularly true for the Keep What You Raise. This is what prevents so many people giving money to Keep What You Raise campaigns, is that even if I think the idea is great, and even though I think you can do it, if you're trying to raise $50,000 and I'm looking at your campaign and you currently have $2,000, I have to ask myself, what's the chance you're going to get from two to 50? Because if I give you money and then you fall short, well, obviously the project's not happening, but you keep my money anyway. And so distilled down, not from the point of view, you're thinking about, yay, I get to keep the money, but I'm thinking about what's happening with my money? You know, if you can't actually do the real project, what's now, what have I funded? Have I just, ha have I just given you money for, for nothing? And obviously no one wants that feeling that they've given their money for nothing or that they're uncertain of the outcomes or that they've been ripped off. And that's what causes a lot of people to hold back from Keep What You Raise fundraising. Essentially what you're saying to people is, hey, check out this great idea, isn't it awesome? Would you please fund it? And whether or not I can actually go ahead with the idea, I'm gonna keep your money no matter what. Some people will go for that, but only those people who already know you and already trust you. It'll make it very hard to convert new people who might have found your story online. It's a big leap for those people 
to trust you with their money, even without any guarantee or certainty about the outcomes that you can create. Whereas for all or nothing crowdfunding, you essentially get to say, I'll only take your money if I can do the project. So all I have to think about is those first two. It kind of removes the third one from the equation altogether. I don't even have to think about it. I know that one of only two things is possible. Either you raise enough money for you to go ahead and to do the project, which is of course what all of us want to happen, or I get to keep my funds, which is the only other acceptable answer for me as a donor. So why would you crowdfund? For a lot of people, it's because they thought that crowdfunding was a type of fundraising that involved less fundraising, to be honest, you know, where they could do less of the hard work and the emotional work of asking people for support and asking for funding. But as I hopefully um, clarified for you earlier, that's simply not the case. Crowdfunding is still all about getting out there, sharing your story and raising the funds. And so the question comes up for people often, once I, once I share this with them, with them of why would why would we use a platform at all i mean you know if it's all about my story my community connections my credibility my hard work what's what's the what's the benefit of even using a platform and it's true some people don't need one some people are, do just fine putting a donate button on their own website um but for a lot of people the platforms play an important role and in some ways i think you can think of platforms as playing the role of a referee that crowdfunding is more game-like than any previous fundraising because it has some really clear rules and it has different outcomes because of those rules. And so the key rule is, and once again, this is I'm talking mostly now about all or nothing crowdfunding because that's the model we believe in that we use. And so the rule is that you only get the funds if you, if you reach your goal. And so that's a game dynamic. It's a very simple game dynamic, but it's still a game dynamic. And that dynamic is that you have a challenge that you need to overcome before the time runs out or you lose the lot. And I know that whole idea of losing the lot is terrifying for you as, as a fundraiser. Um, but it's what gives it this, this, this extra stickiness, this extra engagement, because there's consequences. It matters whether you reach that goal or not. That goal is not just aspirational, take it or leave it. That goal is all or nothing. But how do they know to trust you with that, with that claim? For a new person on the internet, how do they know that when you say, I will only take your money if I reach this goal, that that's how it's gonna work? Well, they know that's how it's gonna work because that's what the platform guarantees. And so that's one of the roles of platforms like Kickstarter or Start Some Good or any of the others that use this, this, um, this method or this model is that we are essentially the referees. We're like, this is, these are the rules and we're gonna enforce them. So we add our credibility and people can trust us around how those outcomes are gonna work. The second is, oh, it's coming up in an odd order, that's strange. The second is transparency around goals and outcomes. That's really what I said before, that as a donor, I want, people really want clarity as to what's actually happening with my money. What's the point of all of this? What, you know, what's the benefit of me giving you these funds? For keep what you raise, that's very hard to provide clarity around. If you're gonna keep the money no matter what, well, the project can't go ahead no matter what, so it creates this uncertainty. Whereas with all or nothing, did I say all or nothing? I meant keep what you raise. I'm getting myself confused now, I hope you're clear. With all or nothing, there is total transparency around outcomes. Either the, either the goal is reached and the project goes forward, or it doesn't and it doesn't, or it isn't and it doesn't. Um, and I can see how close or how far away you are from that goal, and I, and I can be inspired, and will many will be inspired to put in some extra effort or some extra funds to get you to that goal. And so that, transparent, that kind of public fundraising goal has a really strong effect on your supporters. It's what creates that team-like dynamic that we're doing this together, we're all in this together, we have to help you make it to the other side. And so it inspires that deeper connection because I really feel like when you make it to your goal that I really helped make that happen and that you couldn't have done it without me, you probably, which, which is probably true, um, excuse me. And so that transparent, so that, and that then also inspires more sharing. Crowdfunding is uniquely good at converting donors to advocates to people who share. And it's that sharing that's so powerful. That's why we wanted to call it peer funding because it's peer to peer. You obviously need to get it out to the first group of supporters, but then what you hope happens is that some of them share it with their networks, some of whom then support, some of whom then share with their networks, some of whom then support, and you get that, that kind of viral or peer to peer mechanism going. Reduced risk for donors, like I said before. Reduced risk because there isn't the risk of not knowing where my funds are going, of you just keeping my money, but not being able to deliver on the project. Increases urgency because what we know 
uh, for philanthropy in general is that what works for fundraising is urgency and need. You know, that's why disaster of relief, you know, when something terrible happens like a tsunami, an earthquake, um, that's when people are at their most generous and most philanthropic. Why? Because it has the highest possible urgency and the highest possible need. For a lot of the work that we're all doing, that represents a little bit of a challenge because a lot of it, a lot of stuff out there is very important, but it isn't as dire urgent as rescuing people from the aftermath of an earthquake, say, when they've got no food and no shelter, et cetera. And yet it's really important work. So how do we inspire people to give? Well, one of the ways that crowdfunding helps is by artificially, but usefully, ramping up the urgency and the need around your funds raised. If you're trying to raise $10,000, and you're currently on $9,000 and you have two days to go on an all or nothing crowdfunding campaign, we could debate how urgent and needed your actual project is, but everyone intuitively understands how urgently needed that extra $1,000 is because there's $9,000 hanging on the line. And so it really helps focus people and it increases the value of people's contribution. In a way, it's like a dynamic match. We've known for a long time in the not-for-profit sector that match grants work. We do quite a bit of match grant kind of stuff at Start Some Good as well. You should keep an eye on the funding opportunities tab on the homepage to see if any of them ever suit you and your project. But, uh, and, and we know it works because people love having their money match. They love making it feel like their money's going further and doing more. What's great about all or nothing crowdfunding is that you don't even need that original big grant to create the match. But let's say you have that $10,000 goal. Well, in a way, you're matching your most passionate supporters in, against your, le your slightly less passionate so by the time you get to 5,000, you essentially have a match grant set up now. You have $5,000 already committed, but it's conditional on you matching it, on you raising another five to unlock it. By the time you get to 7,500, it's become even better. Now you have a three to one match going on. For every $10 I give you, it's like it unlocks $30. By the time you get to $9,000, there's a nine to one match going on. And eventually you'll get to 9,990 and there'll be a thousand and one to one match on the final $10. And so literally each donation is worth more than the one that came before with all or nothing crowdfunding. And so it helps get that next person off the line. That person was like, oh, I'm not quite sure. And now it becomes so compelling that can't resist. If you're a social enterprise or you have a product that you're launching, crowdfunding is a great way to get it out there without having to spend all the money and take all the risk of manufacturing it up front and then distributing and then distribution and then trying to, you know, trying to figure out sales and who's going to buy it. You can test the market for your product at low cost right away and get that fast market validation to know whether you're onto a winner or whether you need to make changes. It combines commerce and philanthropy and community very gracefully. Normally these are different worlds, but crowdfunding is able to, to offer products, but wrap them in really inspiring stories. And of course it brings together this community dynamic, which is really engaging for people and really inspiring. It generates other forms of support because it plays out in public. When you write a grant application or you pitch to a VC, or you apply for a loan, it's just yes or no, it's zero sum. You either get the funds or you have nothing. But with crowdfunding, sometimes success is snatched from the jaws of victory and sometimes, uh, and other times success is amplified because of the unexpected types of support that come through the public sharing. So we've had projects trying to raise money for technical, for technical work or like web development who have failed to reach their goal, but who have, as a result of their campaign, had someone get in touch with them and offer them pro bono support to build that website anyway. So is that a success or a failure? I mean, if we define the campaign, the goal of the campaign as to find the resources to enable the project to happen, it was a success, even though it actually failed to reach its fundraising goals. And that's something that can only happen because, it ha because the whole thing plays out in public. It actually has a high success rate. I know I emphasized at the start kind of a low success rate, but it's only low compared to a lot of people's expectations or, understand, or misunderstandings about crowdfunding. Compared to almost any other form of fundraising, there are incredibly high success rates in crowdfunding. You know, compared to the success rate of applying for a grant, which is for most grants under 10%, to pitching for a VC, which for most VCs is under 1%, or applying for a loan, to get a third approximately across the industry, and in our case, more than 50% success rate is really awesome. You can start now. This is my favorite in a way. I, I'm entrepreneurial by nature. I'm a doer. And so when I ran um, a previous not-for-profit, I used to write a lot of grant applications. And I actually really enjoyed the process of writing a grant application. You know, it would help me kind of get my ideas down on paper and structure it and have a theory of change and have a budget. And all of that's really helpful. But then I'd hate the waiting game of waiting to hear back whether I got it or not. 
you know, that I'd put this application in the mail and then it would take, you know, one to four months before I'd get another letter back that just said a yes or a no. And that's a very disempowering feeling, actually. That waiting, just waiting for another group of people who you don't know, don't get to meet, don't get to talk to, don't get to answer their questions. They're just going to make judgments based on whether you get to kind of live your dream and do the project that you think your community needs. So what's great about crowdfunding is you don't have to wait for that big yes. You still have to do that planning. You still have to think through how much money you need and what your story is and what your theory of change is. But when you've got those pieces and when you're confident, you can just get started. You don't need to wait um, for that one to four months for the, for the yes or the no. You can go and create that yes or no right now. And what's great about crowdfunding as well is that over the course of your campaign, over your 30 or 40 days, you can try stuff. You can learn and you can evolve how you're pitching your project. So you can improve it. It's not just static in the way that your application is once you put it in the mail. And it creates community ownership. And I think this is the most powerful thing in a way. There's a really special feeling that can be created by a successful crowdfunding campaign where people really come together and did something together as a community. And that can create a really strong level of community engagement and ownership that goes beyond what is normal from a group of customers, beyond what is normal even from a group of donors. And it's that powerful community connection that can really carry your project forward. And whether you're a you know, a volunteer-based community association or a major not-for-profit or a social enterprise with a product, that level of community ownership is going to lead to advocacy, sharing, you know, early adopters, sales, um, volunteers, all the things you really you need beyond money to help you grow. And so in some ways I think that's the most powerful thing about crowdfunding is not the funds, but the community that gets built around it. So I want to tell you a couple of quick stories of projects that use crowdfunding and why they chose crowdfunding. I'm up, out of all these different reasons, what was there? Why, why did they choose crowdfunding rather than, you know, a bake sale or writing gratifications or pitching to rich people? This is the Rhythm Heart. They're a community centre based just north of Sydney in a town called Gosford. And they're dedicated to the rhythmic arts, which is to say drumming. And so they're really noisy and they got evicted from their, cent from their space. And so for them, they chose crowdfunding because of speed. They had an urgent need to come up with funds to move into a new space. And they couldn't just raise the bare minimum. They needed to also be able to afford um, soundproofing or else the whole pattern was going to repeat again. And that's no good. So for them, they had another space lined up. Someone was offering it to them, but they only had a set amount of time to actually raise the deposit to be able to move into it or they'd lose it. And so where would you find $25,000 in 45 days to save a drumming-based community centre? There's no grant. Grants don't move fast enough. Probably not going to get a loan from the bank for your recently evicted community centre. Uh, unless you have some uh, a kind of a high net worth individuals as, as they're known, a, a wealthy person who's strongly passionate about drumming and who you probably already have a well-cultivated relationship with, probably not going to get a big check in that time. So once upon a time, this would entirely have been fundraisers, bank sales, and probably a few key leaders putting it on their credit card at the end of the day. But instead, they were able to use crowdfunding to build a scalable, shareable project very quickly, very simply, but very powerfully, that succeeded in rallying almost 250 supporters to raise the $25,000 they needed in under 45 days. For Yanti, who you see on the screen here, the founder of Learn to Live, it was also speed, but a different kind of speed. She really just wanted to test, maybe not speed, more validation, fast validation. She had an idea to make a difference um, by sending recently graduated medical students to Indonesia, which is where her, her family is originally from. And people kept telling her, well, the first thing you need to do is to set up a, a tax-deductible charity. And Yadi kept thinking, doesn't that take too long? And if I go through that whole process, what if the actual idea is no good? You know, I spend a year or two, I pay, I pay to submit these forms, I wait for the answer, I, I hopefully secure it, although there's no guarantees, that tax-deductible status. But then, A, what if no one even wants to give a donation anyway? What's the value of tax-deductibility if no one actually believes in your project? And B, is, is the project actually going to work on the ground, more importantly? So Yanti raised her initial seed funding on Start Some Good to pilot it. As you see here, it doesn't take thousands of people necessarily. 93 people believed in Yanti. And from them, she was able to raise about $7,000. And with that, send the first group of four medical students over to North Sulawesi. It was a big success. She's now been around, Learn to Live has now been around for about five years. They've crowdfunded with us five times, but they also have become a tax deductible charity. But I think this is a really powerful, you know, in a way, the whole idea of that step one is to become a tax deductible charity is very unlean. And it leads to a lot of wasted time and effort for ideas that are actually not well aligned anyway. 
And so the idea is if you had a really sensible idea, let's actually test my assumptions. Let's make sure A, I can even raise donation capital, and B, that the project will actually work on the ground before we go through the process of becoming a formal charity. And finally, one of my favorite social enterprises to launch and start some good, mighty good undies. These guys launched with us last year and they were founded by two women in uh, London and Sydney who were inspired by, I don't know if you guys came across, the, there was a, a huge Bangladesh uh, garment workers fire disaster a couple of years ago. A lot of, a lot of workers died, but it really revealed how awful the conditions were in the making of a lot of our clothes. And there was a big social media campaign called Who Makes Your Clothes? And these two women, um, Ask themselves that question, who does make our clothes? And in particular, they looked at some of their favorite underwear brands and they were not very impressed with what they discovered and they thought they could do better. And so Mighty Good Undies, their claim is to be the world's uh, most ethical and most comfortable underwear brand. And so for them, why did they crowdfund? Well, they needed a quick and easy way to get that market validation to ensure that they're really on the right track with their product. They don't want donations, they want you to buy underwear because donations are, are great, you know, they wouldn't say no, but they don't actually tell you if you've got a real business. It's only by selling underwear that they actually know if they've got a real business here. And so they essentially want to use crowdfunding, did use crowdfunding like a pop-up shop before building your whole e-commerce infrastructure, before um, put, trying to get go into shops, put up uh, essentially a, a, a one-month pop-up shop in the form of a crowdfunding campaign to ensure that the market demand is there. And of course, once you've proven that market demand is there, the other things become much easier as well. It's easier to get into shops. It's much easier to get the other forms of support you need. Um, they also needed minimums um, in order to afford to bring the, the clothes over um, to Australia and to England. There are minimums. The minimum is a shipping container work, which is going to cost about $40,000. So they needed $40,000 upfront. So they, they set their goal as can we sell 40,000, pre sell $40,000 for funding, which they successfully did. And they launched the Berlin Fashion Week late last year, which is really exciting. And when it works, this is what it feels like. This quote really captures it for me. This is one of the supporters of the Rhythm Hub. And it's actually, there's actually a longer quote, which basically goes, uh, we used to wait for government to do things for us, but now we've realized we can do it for ourselves. Your initiative is transformative. Our community came together in a way that raised their sense of ownership to a new level. That's really powerful. That's probably more powerful than money. Um, but it's created you know, alongside money. What's great about crowdfunding is that it raises money from customers, it raises money from supporters, it raises money from community members. So it creates these really strong ties with people who really care and are real stakeholders of the project. So let's step back again, as I keep encouraging us to do, and think about our donors and their motivations. Why are they going to give us money? We know why we want money, but why will they give it to us? There's only four core reasons we think why people ever part with their money. The first is our expectation or hope for future financial return. So that's what we call investing. We're sending our money away and hoping it comes back with friends. The second, which we'd all be very familiar with, is that there's a good or service that we want for ourselves. They're solving a problem for us personally, and we call that shopping. The third is that we're supporting an outcome that's beyond ourselves. Similar to the above, it, there's obviously a problem or shortcoming we perceive, and we're hoping that it can be fixed, and we're giving other people money to do that. Um, that's what we call philanthropy, funding organizations to work on problems or to make things better um, in the wider world beyond us. And the fourth one is the one that's missing from the traditional economics textbooks, but is so important to crowdfunding. And that's that we express relationships through money. We support our friends. To give a crowdfunding example of this, I've supported a friend's crowdfunder to release an album of music I don't like. I'm not into, them, not into their music, but I'm really into them. I really like them. I want them to you know, lead a happy, successful life. And if this crowdfunding campaign, if this album is, is part of you know, what's going to help them be happy and successful, I, I'm really happy to support it. I want to see it go ahead. Now, the first one is not kind of widely available yet. It's starting to be, but it's, it's available under, some, under certain conditions in the US. It's about to become available under certain conditions in Australia. There's some happening in the UK. It's a, it's a spreading movement, but often it puts quite strict conditions. For instance, in Australia, you have to be an unlisted public company, et cetera. So we're going to put that aside for now, as that's not what we do yet on Start Some Good. So we're looking at the other three. And you've got these three to play with. And we think the best campaigns really focus on leveraging all of these, that they do provide tangible rewards. Now, rewards don't have to be in the form of a product like, a, like Mighty Good Undies. You don't have to be like a manufacturer per se. But everyone can offer rewards 
that people actually enjoy, whether it's a cool t-shirt with your logo or a slogan on it or an invitation to an event or um, an associate producer credit on the film. There's things that you will be able to offer that your supporters will value in a similar way that they will value and they'll value enough that they will actually kind of think that they'll be prepared to exchange money for those things. So you'll be triggering their shopping instinct. Now, of course, if you're using Start Some Good, I assume you're contemplating of you're, you're working on a project that creates a positive social impact. And that's what you'll need to be working on if you want to use our site. And so you've got the philanthropy story, the social change story. And all of us have friends and relationships. And it's so important to encourage them to get involved and to include them in your crowdfunding campaign. Now, what's interesting also to note is that while that first one is nominally analytical, the bottom three are all emotional. So crowdfunding is about emotional drivers of giving behavior. Um, now, one of, you, one of the key decisions you'll have to make as you are building, are creating your campaign is, how, is where to set your goal, essentially. You'll be asking yourself, how much can I raise? Or, same question really, what do I need to raise in order for this project to go ahead? And therefore, how much work do I need to do to reach that goal? People ask me all the time, how much can I raise on your platform? And it's actually the wrong question because I, I don't know how much you can raise on my platform. Because I don't know your issue as well as you know. I don't know how I don't know your networks as well as you know them, and I don't know how hard you're prepared to work in the way that you do. In a way, it's a little bit like going to a post office, buying a thousand stamps, and asking the guy behind the counter, "How much money can I raise with these stamps?" Well, you could raise no money with a thousand stamps, or you could raise a hundred million dollars with a thousand stamps. It entirely depends on two things: what letter are you putting inside those envelopes, and who are you addressing them to. And those two things exist as two halves of the same coin. A story is only as good as the audience that's listening to it, as, as it is targeted to the audience that's hearing it. There's no like automatically successful fundraising stories. You could write the best, most impassioned, most inspiring uh, letter in the world for, let's say, anti-gun campaigning. But if you, actually, if you accidentally send that letter to the membership list of the NRA, you're probably not going to raise any money. And so it's on you to really think about those two things. This is why I can't tell you how much you can raise. Because I'm like the postal worker who knows what stamps you need. Like, I, I want to send a thousand letters. I want to send them within America. I'm like, okay, I know what stamps you need. Here's how you do it. Um, but you know what you need to say on the letter. And you need to think about who you want to write to, to share this with. But we can help you think through those questions. We can help you design them. And so here's the formula for how much you can raise. And this is true for any type of fundraising. This isn't just crowdfunding. As I said, crowdfunding is just an, another tactic for fundraising, but a lot of the underlying principles and strategies remain the same. And so for any fundraising, your success will depend on this formula. Reach times propensity times capacity. So how many people will you reach with your story? And of the people you reach with your story, what's their propensity to support you, i.e. how much do they care? And what's their capacity to support you, i.e. how much do they have? And there's a bunch of things that affect these. Of course, for reach, one of the big things is where are you starting from? What's your existing community like or your existing relationships? If you're an organization, that means your existing email list, your donors, your board. If you're an individual, that means the, you know, the, how, how big are your networks? How connected are you to other people? How, how interested are they in your work? Uh, social media reach, partnerships, PR hooks, newsworthiness. Not every project has the same cachet in terms of newsworthiness. Um, if you're doing something right now about, I don't know, uh, improving at the moment. Yeah, there's a project that I know that's building at the moment, which is on um, helping people verify facts online. A year ago, that might have been a really hard campaign to get to get written about because it seems really esoteric. Today, that's quite newsy. That's quite newsworthy because of the conversation we're all having today about fake news and so on, and how we how we trust information we see online. So that's become more newsworthy than it would have been a year ago. So campaigns have different newsworthiness, how well they connect with kind of what, what the key issues of the day are. And then partnerships are a great way to increase your reach. And remember what matters is relevant reach. We're about to get on to the propensity and capacity next, but your reach is only as good as those next two things as well. Reaching people who have no propensity to support you has no value. So partnerships are a great way you can do that. If you're, um, if you're, I don't know, hypothetically, a B Corp and you're doing something that is promoting social enterprise, the B Corp move, you know, B, B Labs would, would help share that for you. Whatever you're doing, there are likely organizations, conferences, um, thought leaders, influential Twitter accounts, et cetera, who are really focused on that specific issue and who you can hopefully partner with to help share your story with a really relevant, engaged audience. 
And of course, hard work. The harder you work, the more you can get it out there. You can just do more, of course, if you're prepared to do more. Then propensity. So this is telling the right story to the right people. Targeting. And this is also where the page itself does matter. Your page could be the best page in the world. And of course, it's not worth anything if, if your outreach hasn't brought people back to check it out. But once they've come back to check it out, the quality of the page will, will, will influence how strongly they convert. And so this is where your presentation in terms of your, 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 your words, your pictures, your video makes a real difference in getting people across the line. Uh, urgency, how much people care in general. You know, obviously some issues have um, greater popularity in general, like, uh, what's a good issue? You know, uh, uh, versus, versus more niche issues. And other, and of course, people also have different levels of depth of emotional connection. There are certain uh, issues that are famous for people feeling particularly strongly about, let's say animal rights or, or, or identity-based issues, people naturally feel very strongly about. Um, and of course, those depth, that depth of feeling makes them more inclined to support things, to fund projects that, that appeal to their, to their, um, their identity or their, or their sense of justice, etc. And finally, capacity. People, of course, need to have enough money to, to share in order to be uh, contributors to a fundraising campaign. Um, so the target, this is also an aspect of targeting, but this is where rewards comes in very strongly because rewards changes your sense of capacity around what you can give. Take me for example, I give a small amount of money to lots of campaigns each year. You know, I probably give 20 bucks to hundreds of campaigns. Uh, and it's hard for me to give more than $20 because I know that I'm going to give money to lots of campaigns anyway. And so to get more than that out of me for a single campaign is a hard sell. Unless of course you're offering me something extra. I gave Mighty Good Undies $65, and you can probably guess why, because they are sending me a pack of undies. Um, now, I know that I need to spend money on undies, undies anyway, so I, I think of that as not needing to, in a way, compete with some of those other $20 contributions. I'm giving the first $20 out of my philanthropic support for what they're doing. The other $45 was me buying undies. And so having rewards that are meaningful and that people actually like, um, another one, a t-shirt recently, I, I, bought a, I bought a cool t-shirt for $45. So you think, once again, the first $20 was me philanthropically supporting it. The next $25 was because I wanted a t-shirt. Um, so offering meaningful rewards changes people's perception of their capacity because you're kind of dipping into different budgets, different mental budgets in their mind. And then need. And this, once again, is where all or nothing crowdfunding has a huge advantage. The fact that you need to get to that goal changes my perception of what I, how much I can afford to support you. I recently gave um, $20 to a friend and then I gave another $20 towards the end. So I gave my regular $20 at the start, but then they had a dated, you know, actually when I gave probably about two hours to go and they needed a little bit more, they were really pushing towards the deadline. They ended up making it with 52 minutes to go. Woo! Um, it's scary for them, but that's how it works. The reason they made it was because we all kind of rallied around. No one wanted to see them fall short. And that's what inspired me to give again, to give another 20 so whereas if you'd asked me three weeks earlier, I would have said I can only give $20 to this campaign. My perception of my capacity to give had changed because the need had shifted. Simon Sinek, I think, is a really insightful guy when it comes to people's motivations and why they do what they do. His book's worth reading, but if you want the kind of shorter, sharper version, he's got a wonderful TED talk or even two or three TED talks, I think, now. And this is a great quote by him. When people are financially invested, they want to return. When people are emotionally invested, they want to contribute. That's really what crowdfunding does. It builds that emotional connection so people want to do more, they want to share, and they want to make sure it reaches its finish line successfully. And that's why you never fall just short. The, the nightmare scenario with all or nothing crowdfunding is that you get you know, $9,500 and then you fall short of your $10,000 target and you lose it all. That literally never happens. If enough people care to get you to $9,500, then you will get to $10,000. Because the easiest $500 to raise at any point in that fundraiser is the 500 from 9,500 to 10,000. Every previous $500 um, kind of segment has been harder than that one. And you've already done it 19 times. And so the idea that you would do it the first 19 times and then not be able to do it the 20th time is almost impossible. Um, if, people's, if people cared so little that they would be willing to let you fall short in that situation, then you never would have been able to raise the first 95% of your goal in the first place. But coming back to this quote, you know, and it connects with what I was saying before about motivations, we're, we're making people care. So it's emotionally driven fundraising. So what's the human technology for making people care? 
and it's a it's a human technology that's been around since before there was history, and that is storytelling. And so all fundraising comes down to storytelling, really. We're telling a story about the future. Within that story is contained our belief, our theory around how we're going to make the world better, around kind of what the shortcoming at the moment is and what we can do about that, and an invitation for people to participate. So you're sharing essentially your theory of change. You probably shouldn't call it that. It's a bit jargony. I'm a political science major. I can't help it. But a theory of change, this is the most simple kind of a theory of change you can have. We do this, then this happens, and then it helps create the change we want in the world. And so the most successful crowdfunding campaigns often have simple theories of change with only about this number of steps. We, we do this, I succeed at this crowdfunding campaign, then this happens, I spend the money in that, you know, I spend the money to do the things I described, and then that directly helps create the change we want to see. This is why it's a bit harder to crowdfund for things that are infrastructure, such as technology. Websites and apps have longer theories of change than this because they can never promise that it they, because when they launch, they never automatically create the change they want to see. They then rely on people coming to the site or using the app or changing their behavior in the predicted way to actually create change. And so there's an extra step and there's less ability to promise. Whereas if I'm raising money because I am um, going to open a skills training center in LA to train 50 homeless young people in hospitality skills, well, I can probably guarantee that if I do raise these funds, I will train those 50 young people. So we do this, raise the money I need. This happens. I open the center and get the first 50 young people in. And then it creates the change we want to see in the world, which is more confident, um, you know, kids who are more confident with, with greater employment skills and hopefully ready to go and stand on their own feet. So you need to think about how to kind of simplify your theory of change as much as possible. Obviously, not unrealistically. It has to, you know, it has to contain the elements it has to contain. But your job is to help people visualize that future, to paint a picture that's so evocative and compelling that I can see it. And if it has too many steps and it involves, you know, we're doing this long-term research and then we're going to analyze our outcomes and then we're going to design, we're going to co-design projects and then we're going to test those projects and then ultimately down, down the line we'll have found the right approach and we'll have empowered this community. All of that becomes really hard to visualize. It's too diverse. It's got too many assumptions. It's got too many... Um, uh, kind of it, too many things that are reliant on other things happening that you are not fully in control of. So that's the first thing, that you need to kind of have a really punchy story that is easy for you to tell and easy to get people excited about. And then the second thing is to find people who already care. And this is counterintuitive for a lot of fundraisers, particularly a lot of people raising money for social causes, because if you're raising money for a social cause, I almost guarantee you that one of the things that you feel would make your cause better and would make the world better is if more people were also focused on that social cause. And if only we could get more people to focus on this issue and to care about this issue, then we can make the world better. And that's probably true. But the crowd, that's not the job of the crowdfunding campaign. That might be the job of the actual project. You might be raising money to run a pro-veganism campaign that will convince people to eat less meat. That's awesome. So it's the job of the project to convert people to caring about something they don't currently care about, eating less meat, not the job of the crowdfunding campaign that's raising money for that project. That campaign is obviously going to be funded by vegans. We don't fund people to then talk us into doing things differently. I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, I always thought I should eat less meat. Here's some money so that you can build a sophisticated public campaign to then put pressure back on me so I will eat less meat. That's not how it works at all. It's people are like, yeah, I don't eat meat and I wish people ate less meat. So here's some money, go, go do that work. It's a little bit like coming back to the team building analogy. If you decided you wanted to set up a basketball competition at your work, you don't walk around telling people that baseball sucks and that your sport is better, and that, you know, that, that, they're, that they follow the wrong sport and that they, have, they should be into the sport that you're into and this is why basketball is so good. You simply go, who's into basketball? And then once you're talking to the people who at least like basketball already, you say, who wants to be part of a competition? Let's start a, let's start a team. Um, and so you've got to connect around a shared interest. It's no way to build a community or a team or a friendship by telling people from the start that the things they believe in are wrong and that they need to change their minds. You instead need to find something that you can connect around that you have in common. And we call this the five hooks of social change. So because you have to connect with people about a shared interest, that doesn't mean that you only get to talk to people who share, say, your exact interest in veganism. You just need to find a common ground to meet them on in order to build that relationship. And you can do that through these hooks. 
I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So the issue hook is the obvious one. You know, for, for a social cause crowdfunding campaign, that's normally where we start. The problem is, is that, that it's where too many people finish up as well. This is the only story they tell. So the, the, the issue hook is, is, you know, it's the issue. It's the thing that you're trying to make better. This particular example is a project called Launchpad, run by an organization called One Girl, which distributed sanitary pads to teenage girls in the developing world so that they'd be able to stay in school for an extra week a year, where currently in many places they have to stay home, which of course has huge negative impacts on their education. Um, and we know that in, in improving girls' education is one of the most direct and powerful ways to improve development overall. And so this has two issues. So, you know, issues are complicated, they're nestled inside each other. And so this, this particular project has two key issue stories, I'd say. One is around women's health, the extrinsic rights, or women, girls' education, you could even say, the ex ex extrinsic rights of those, intrinsic rights, I mean to say, of those girls to receive a fair education equivalent to what the boys are getting. And then there's also this kind of meta story around development and around girls' education as an intervention that creates development outcomes. And so for each of those, you know, for women's rights, women's health, those organizations, conferences, Twitter accounts, Facebook groups that are committed to that, to, the, to discussing those specific, that specific issue. And there are the same around development. And so you'd want to craft a slightly different issue story to reach out to, to each of those key networks. This is a great example of that as well. This is the Black Rainbow Living Well Foundation. They recently launched via a crowdfunding campaign with us, and they're the first organization that's grappling with the unique challenges, the unique um, mental health challenges of GLBTQI indigenous young people in Australia. And so in a way, their logo is this Venn diagram with these three areas, and it represents the three areas they overlap with. And essentially, that they're saying to each of these communities, you're, you're missing this group. There's a, there's a group falling through the cracks of, of the services currently being provided. And those three communities are the mental health, anti-suicide community, the indigenous community, and the GLBTQI community. Um, and so for each of those, they of course have, you'd have the, an individual outreach campaign, and there'll be different magazines, media, organs, um, conferences, not-for-profits, not groups, networking groups, etc. for each of those. Secondly, the geography story. Everyone cares about the place they are. Well, almost everyone cares about where they live, you know. We may not care in big picture terms about the environment, but we want our, like, our town to have fresh water and clean air. We may not think about homelessness much, but then if someone starts sleeping on our doorstep, we'll be thinking about it a lot. Um, now, as a, as a fundraiser, that's, that's a connection that you, can, you know, that you can use to also build your community. And it's not just places where people are, it's anywhere that they've had a strong kind of emotional experience or places that they're from. I'm from, this is Yanti again, and her work was in Indonesia, so obviously targeting the Indonesia diaspora in Australia was key. I'm originally from a town in Western Australia called Fremantle, and I must have supported maybe a dozen crowdfunding campaigns back in Fremantle. Often campaigns that I derive no direct benefit from, but I just feel proud that it's the kind of thing that's happening in Fremantle, and I get a you know I get a kick out of thinking, yeah, it's awesome. Fremantle's a, a cool, progressive place, and I want you know I want that to stay the same. Um, and so I'm supporting it through that hook, through that connection. Um, thirdly, the team. What is the team telling us um, about the project, about the world? Is, is, is there something inspiring or, or unique about that? So this particular project was called, um, they called themselves the Oakland Dons and they were raising money to start a community garden in West Oakland. Um, and so obviously if you look at the issue story, it was around access to fresh fruit and nutrition. Uh, that's connected to a place story with West Oakland being one of the biggest food deserts in America. Those are both powerful stories, but neither of them are specifically why I contributed to this project. I contributed because I'm really passionate about youth entrepreneurship. That's the work I did previously uh, in a not-for-profit I ran. I love to see, you know, kids this age and older really stepping up, or younger as well, stepping up and making a difference in their communities and taking on a leadership role. And so I get excited when I see that happen and I'm prepared to help chip in and support more of that happening. So you can imagine if these guys, instead of doing community gardening in, gardening in Oakland, were, let's say, um, teaching English to undocumented immigrants in San Diego, let's say, um, anyone who was really passionate about community gardening is now their propensity to support is significantly diminished. Or if anyone who's from Oakland, and that was their point of inspiration, their propensity to support is significantly diminished. But my propensity is exactly the same, because it still tells me the story of youth entrepreneurship. The fourth one is the innovation story or the approach. This is probably my favorite. This is the how story. We've had the what, where, who, how. How are you making a difference on the issue that you care about? What are you doing 
What are you doing that's kind of new or noteworthy or interesting or innovative about that? This particular project is called uh, Speech for Good, and it was um, a speech therapy app that helped people with a stutter. And one of the reasons that this campaign succeeded was it got picked up by the huge tech blog Mashable. Um, and you can imagine that, and that's a great example of the right story to the right audience. If Jack, the founder of this project, had written to Mashable with the issue story, i.e. find out how we're delivering speech therapy to people with a stutter who can't afford it, there's no way that press release has even been opened by the Mashable journalist. That's just too far off base for them. But instead, I imagine the press release was something like, find out how we're disrupting, how we're using mobile technology to disrupt speech therapy. And Mashable was like, that sounds really interesting. That's what we're into. And so they wrote a blog post about it and that drove a whole bunch of traffic. And so that's a great example of the right story to the right audience is what gets results. This is a great example of this. Also, this is a story in Philadelphia, uh, sorry, a project in Philadelphia called Gear Up for Change. And it takes recently incarcerated or drug addicted women out road cycling as part of a program to help them get back on their feet and rebuild their lives. Now, that's pretty niche. You know, ex, you know ex, ex, ex previously incarcerated and drug addicted women in Philadelphia. Do enough people, will enough people respond to that issue story? And that's going to be a challenge. You know, not, most people are not in, the, not in the market, not in the mood for a you know, heavy, serious story like that when they're just browsing their Twitter or Facebook accounts, perhaps. But there's a whole group of people out there who are really going to respond to this story. And I'm, I'm guessing you've probably already guessed who they are. But they're cyclists. They don't have to necessarily be already thinking about or specifically focused on you know, recidivism rates around for, um, formerly incarcerated women in Philadelphia and how to reduce those. They will be really interested in a story that says, find out how we're using cycling to change lives. And they're likely to really re resonate with that and think, yes, that is a great way to change lives. I know it's made a big difference in my life too. And so that's the way that without having to hit people in the head and saying, you're a bad person, you should think more, more about, you should care more about these women, you should, should think more about them. You find that point of commonality where you can go, are you, are you into cycling? We're into cycling too. Find out this awesome thing we're doing with cycling that's making a difference. And, and of course, that's going to attract a whole bunch of new people willing to kick, click across from Twitter or Facebook or wherever to check it out. And finally, the community st story. That, so we've had the what, where, who, uh, sorry, what, what it was again, the what, where, who, how, that's right, sorry. <laughs> and this is the we, which I know doesn't totally follow. But it's when, when supporting a campaign is essentially an act of self-identity self-identification as part of the community. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the Burning Man Festival. It's a counterculture festival that takes place annually in Nevada. This is a project that grew out of that festival to put in, uh, to create a, an online radio station. And so obviously the people who supported this are people who you know, consider themselves part of the Burning Man community or burners in the parlance. Um, uh, um, uh, maybe a more uh, kind of a, uh, a less esoteric example might be this, which is raising scholarship funds for a leadership program. We get quite a few of these, and they always have to work in essentially the same way, which is that they raise money from their alumni. It's, uh, you can't, it's hard to raise money for a scholarship to a leadership program purely based on the issue story. The issue story might be, we need more leadership around, CSL stands for Center for Sustainability Leadership, so helping people um, take greater leadership around sustainability issues. So the issue story would be, we need more leadership around sustainability. I'd be like, yeah, you, yeah we do, that's a really good point. They're like, okay, the way we're going to do that is by raising one scholarship for this program for $9,000. I'm like, uh oh, how do I know this is the right program? Even if I agree with the premise, I don't know anything about this program. I haven't done it. I'm not sure if it's the right place to send people. That seems expensive for something that I don't know very much about, etc. So it's hard to get across the fence for that. Whereas the people who do, of course, know and believe that this is the right program and know that the impact that can have on an individual are those who've already done it. And you can see here in the text, this is probably the the clearest example of this ever, they're very direct about that. We have all, it starts with we. So it's very directly the we story. If you're not part of the we they're talking to, they're not expecting you to fund this. And then down the very bottom, in short, this is a way to share the love and pay it forward. This is the quintessential we story or community story. And then finally, because you can't forget it, your story. You have to include your story. Remembering that one of the key reasons people will otherwise hold back from supporting you even if they agree with your idea, it's because they're uncertain about whether you're the right person to carry that idea forward. So to reassure them and to get over the line, you have to introduce yourself to us. You don't need incredible academic credentials or, or even a track record necessarily. At the very minimum though, you need to show us that you're a real person who's deeply passionate and committed to seeing it through. Then if you feel like you do want to bring some more credibility to it, you can 
potentially, but you don't have them, but you don't have that track record yourself. You can potentially create that through partners by, by showing who you partner. Like for instance, if you're building an app, let's say, but you're not yourself an app developer and you don't have a track record, identifying who your development partner is so that you can include them on your, your campaign is, is a great way to increase that credibility, reduce that risk. But one way or another, you have to introduce yourself to us. And this is a great job for video, I think, in crowdfunding campaigns. It's why we insist on videos um, on our platform because it's such a uniquely good me medium to actually introduce yourself to us and to give us a little flavor of you that never comes out through just words or, excuse me, or even photos. So here's our model for how crowdfunding really happens. You start in the middle and you work your way out. So you start with peers. What do I mean by peers? I mean anyone who you really know. I mean real relationships in the real world or even real relationships in the online world. But essentially anyone whose name you know or who knows your name is essentially what we're talking about as a peer. Then tribes. Tribes are the people who are going to respond to those specific stories that we were just covering. You know, by tribes, we don't mean like a community who thinks of itself as a community necessarily, but rather like a community of interest, a shared passion for something, whether it's cyclists or people who are from Fremantle or passionate about Fremantle or those who are passionate about youth entrepreneurship, etc. And then on the outside, crowds. And crowds hardly ever happens, to be honest. But, you know, every so often, um, a crowdfunding campaign breaks out into the wider popular consciousness. But given that there's tens of thousands of crowdfunding camp campaigns happening at any one point in time now, that's very rare and not something you can really plan for. What you can plan for is just being, a, is just succeeding, being great at the peer bit, being great at the tribe bit. And then if that all works, you have the possibility of breaking out and getting mainstream media coverage, which, is, which often only occurs once you've already reached or exceeded your goals and surprised people in some way. The reason you have to start with peers is because they help validate you in the eyes of the tribes. They help, they help make you seem less risky and more credible because there's nothing more credible than having money already having money already committed. It's almost impossible to raise money from the tribe on day one because no matter how good the idea is, a crowdfunding campaign with zero supporters is inherently uninspiring. And so the, power, the, the, the challenge for any crowdfunding campaign is always who's going to support it when it has no supporters. So who's going to be the first person to turn up to your party? That's going to be a friend. That's going to be someone who already knows you because they're not, not worried about whether you're a con artist. They know you're not. They know you're good for it. So they have less concerns. You have to, you have to do less to reassure them. And they have more outcomes they care about. As with the example I gave earlier of me caring about my friend enough to support his fundraising campaign to release an album of music I don't like, Clearly, no one else is going to do that. Oh, you'd have, you know, because I had that extra layer of motivation, that extra interest in a different kind of outcome, the outcome on a personal level to help someone live a dream, not just the outcome on the societal level to help get more of a particular type of music out there or to help a particular beneficiary group. So you really need to activate your peers first. And then by having their support already on board, it becomes more compelling and feels more trustworthy for the tribes because they can see that there's other people who have already taken the plunge and other people who trust you becomes easier for them to trust you as well. It's a little bit like turning up to a restaurant and the difference between that restaurant being empty versus full. If it's empty, you might be really second guessing your choices and wondering whether you want to go somewhere else. If it's full, you'll be excited and you'll feel totally validated about your choice of restaurant and excited to try the food. So once you've designed your campaign and got it out there, obviously you'll need to market it. And this is like a whole longer piece and you all have access to discount access to our masterclass and I really recommend you go check that out for, for a longer, ver you know, to, for, for more information particularly around the marketing piece. But one thing I will say is you need to have a plan. It doesn't happen automatically, as I said right at the start. It's on you to really think about who needs to be part of your community, who needs to hear your story and how you're going to reach out to them. Whatever you do, line up your initial donors. Don't launch unless you have firm commitments from a dozen people to chip in on day one. More is more. There's no set. There's no perfect set number, but you want you need those one, day one donors to help get other people off the fence. And day one donors will almost always be your personal relationships. So don't leave that up to chance. Talk to them about it. Get them excited. Get them primed, and then activate them on the first day. Be really specific about the tribes you're reaching and how you're reaching them. A lot of people in their crowdfunding campaigns they do the internet equivalent of buying those thousand stamps and then literally just picking a thousand addresses at random out of the phone book and sending those letters to them and hoping that they 
turn out to be interested and are willing to give. In other words, they just throw it out randomly. They just, they just share it over and over and again on their own Twitter account. They might ask Obama or Oprah or Justin Bieber to retweet them, even though those people have no connection or interest or anything with their particular issue. They're just desperate for numbers, any numbers. Um, so they're not being thoughtful about the tribes they're reaching. Once you have a specific group of people you want to reach, you can really plan on how you're going to reach them. What are the channel? What blogs do they read? What hashtags are the right hashtags? What medium even are they more likely? Are they, are they, is Twitter the right thing or is Snapchat, etc. So use the channels that your that the supporters you're trying to reach use, not just the ones that you yourself are comfortable with. Examine similar campaigns and in particular Google search to try and pick up on who has linked to them and who has written about them. Because that can then provide a bit of a hit list, you know, a media hit list for you to write to that, those bloggers or journalists yourself. Be ready to work hard and keep it real. You know, share emotion. If you're getting towards the finish line and you have a little bit further to go to reach your, what we call your tipping point, your all or nothing goal, be really honest about how scary that is. Make, make sure people understand how hard you're working and how much you care. Because if you don't care, there's no reason for me to care. You know, there's no way that me as a potential supporter is going to care more than you. So if you are acting a bit too cool for school and like you only care a little bit, I'm going to care less than that, um, which probably won't be enough to actually support or give you any funds. Um, this, is the, this is the average distribution of funds within a successful crowdfunding campaign. Just to reinforce how important getting off to that good start is, you'll see that successful campaigns, they have a huge day one. Not all, always, but almost always. So you don't want to leave that up for chance. You don't just want to launch it out there and tweet, it, tweet a few times and wait to see who supports you. The reason they have a big day one is because they've primed the supporters for that day one. It doesn't have much chance. And then you'll see also that the deadline is huge. And so by far your two most powerful moments to raise money in a crowdfunding campaign is your first week and your last week. And this is why more time is not as, is not as useful as you might think. We really recommend 30 days. Because even if you doubled that to 60 days, you still only get one launch week, you still only get one deadline week, you've just pulled out that trough in the middle to create this longer, harder, more, more draining um, uh, you know, period of time when you just probably burn yourself out for very little fundraising success. We think 30 days is kind of the perfect spacing from that, day, from that launch day through to the end. When you're planning about how to reach your tribe, you need to really ask yourself questions about them. As I said, it's all about what they do and how you're going to reach them. So we really suggest developing a persona for each target tribe. If you're not familiar with personas, just Google how to create a persona. But essentially, a persona is a target market described as a single individual. So if I was building a target market here in Sydney, say I might, I might call them, you know, Sid or, or Sydney Sid. And then I begin to build this persona. I said, a 28-year-old male, they, they, they work full-time, they, um, they have a university degree, they mostly get their news from Twitter and social media. They're somewhat connected to social causes, but they're not, as, but they're not active in the way they used to be at uni, and sometimes they feel a bit guilty about that because they're, they're so busy with their work and they're in a serious relationship, etc. So you build this persona, you, you describe this person. Um, a lot of people resist this because they, they say, accurately enough, that that this single person doesn't accurately describe their, you know, all their supporters. And that's true. But if you don't get that detailed, where you leave it won't be accurate either. Most people will, will leave it instead of these broad demographic sweeps. I'll say my target market are 15, uh, 25 to 45 year old men in Sydney. I mean, what does that mean either? That, that's, not, that's not accurate either. It's, but it's, it's uselessly inaccurate. Whereas the persona is usefully inaccurate. It helps focus you in on an archetypal potential supporter and then really design a campaign that will work for them rather than leaving you in this space of demographics where you, you know, there's no particular thing I can do to reach 25 to 45 year old men in Sydney, no particular set of actions that achieve that goal because they're too diverse and there's too many of them. So just a quick note on rewards. As I said, the key thing about rewards is to really kind of trigger that shopping instinct so that you get that diversification of, of self-interest in the people who are supporting you. The way you do that is, you know, you design stuff that's specific for your campaign, of course, and that amplifies the stories you're telling. But they can come from a variety of different places. Um, sorry, so think about if, there's, if does your campaign produce anything itself or can you? The best projects will do double duty. So if you look at the bottom there, say, the, the life cycle ones, um, if I was willing to buy that T-shirt or the, that sticker and I, and I actually wore that T-shirt around, 
which I like to do. I like kind of startup t-shirts. I like slogan t-shirts. I like literally wearing my heart on my, on my chest when it comes to the issues I care about. Then not only have they created something that makes me feel rewarded and that, help, that helps them raise more money from me, but now that I am wearing the shirt around, I'm actually advertising their business as well. So this is what we call a reward that does double duty. It's good for me, but also good for you. Um, for instance, that one in the middle, the cookbook, that was a, 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 a kind of veganism project. And of course, the cookbook is not just to help raise money. It actually helps people live the lifestyle more effectively by giving them the resources. On the left there, you'll see flip-flops uh, for a, an organization called Community Brave that was doing um, advocacy about around marriage equality. Flip-flops are useful, you know, anyway. We all, well, we don't know if we all buy them, but most people in Australia have a, have a couple of pairs at least. These particular flip-flops actually say marriage equality in the sand when you walk. Um, so once again, doing double duty. So you'll think, you should think about stuff that, that's relevant for you. But as a rule of thumb, you're more likely to raise $12,000 with good rewards than $10,000 with no rewards. So in the example that we've, been, that we've been touching on through the presentation, where you need to raise 10,000, your best chance to raise 10,000 may in fact be to put your kids to put your all or nothing goal at 12,000 in order to cover the cost of the rewards and to offer some compelling rewards to people to help them get off the fence. And as I said, you can have some fun with that. You can collaborate with designers, you can create some cool stuff. That picture halfway up the right hand side, that's an environmental charity in Canada and they just partnered with a photographer who made available some beautiful prints. So that didn't cost them anything, but they were really meaningful. You know, if, you were, if you're willing to support the work of this charity to support the wild, you know, the beautiful Canadian wilderness, then, you may, then you're likely to also value a beautiful piece of art that represents that. So some key decisions you have to make before you start. Obviously, what project are you fundraising for? How specific can you be around that project? How, 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 how well can you paint a picture of the outcomes that you're going to create? It must be specific. It must be time limited. The money must pay for some specific set of actions that take place within a specific set of within a specific time frame. How much do you want to raise and where are you going to put your all or nothing goal or what we call your tipping point? On Start Some Good, we have a unique system, which I think is also why we have a high success rate. So it really gives you the best of both worlds, which is that you get to, you get to choose two goals before you launch. There's an all or nothing goal, which we call the tipping point. That's the one you have to reach or we won't be able to transfer, the, we won't be able to process any pledges. But you'll also be able to articulate what we call the ultimate goal, or you, or you can also get called a stretch goal. That can be up to 4x the tipping point goal, and that's unlocked when you reach the first goal. That goal is essentially keep what you raise. So you're able to kind of calibrate the risk a bit more accurately. You're able to articulate your kind of most ambitious goal, but without living or dying on that goal. But you still get to take advantage of the great, of the powerful game dynamics and the, of an all or nothing crowdfunder that helps increase your success by defining a key milestone a tipping point that does allow the project to go forward in some, in some form. How long will your campaign last? As, as I said, we recommend 30 days, but up to 40 is fine. We think 60 is too long. We've had as short as 48 hours, but I think that's terrifying personally. <laughs> no, I would not do that from my campaign. Um, but, you know, it, that may be how you want to play it. That's, that was the one night stand project, um, Social Enterprise. They did really well, actually. I had to talk them out of making it 24 hours though. They wanted to do the entire fundraiser as a, you know, as a one night stand, as staying up all night. I thought that was too, too little time. Um, what's your outreach plan? Don't leave it up to chance. You have to have one. And what rewards will you offer? Can you create more of that shopping instinct? Can you have some fun with it? Can you find rewards that do double duty and support your outcomes even while making me feel more rewarded and more connected as a supporter? So here's the formula. Sorry, I need to do a bit of design work on this slide. But just to summarize kind of everything we've talked about, you have three motivations you can trigger in potential supporters. A personal motivation, something for me. Societal motivation, something good for the world. And relational motivation, good for you. Um, for the people who care about you. Five key stories or hooks to incorporate now. And some projects have multiple, some don't. Um, but issue, geography, team, approach or innovation, or community identity. And then don't forget your personal story. Whatever other collection of stories you're telling, your personal story needs to be part of it. Then knowing who, who you want to reach and why they will care, having that thoughtfulness, having that insight, actually spending some time thinking about who your supporters are and why they're going to support you. So you know, if you're not just throwing it out there into the world with you, you're trying to build, a, you're trying to reach a specific group of people because without that, you, you know, it's pretty hard to run a successful marketing campaign. And finally, hard work. Uh, and obviously a realistic goal. Um, if you just, even if you do all the other, all the above things, it's hard to raise, you know, $5 million. So you need to have it somewhere in, 
a ballpark that represents your your networks, the work you're prepared to put in, your existing track record, and the overall level of interest. But there's no particular. But you know, with by doing those things right, there really is no particular limit to sort of to the amount that you can reach. Um, so some final takeaway lessons: remember that always that fundraising is always about asking. It's about asking people for support. Just tweeting is not enough, and certainly not do, not even tweeting is woefully insufficient. You need to get off to a really good start, but remember to finish strong as well. That if you're even remotely within striking distance, then you are on track to make it. On our site, we have had every campaign that has had less th that has been at least halfway, with at least five days to go, has made it the rest of the way. It's really powerful what a deadline can do. Humans are very deadline focused. And remember to start with your friends. Their validation and their early support and their advocacy is key to getting your crowdfunding campaign off to a great start. They're likely to be your day one money. And without day one money, it's really hard for a crowdfunding campaign to reach its goals. And then out the other side, remember to thank everyone. Crowdfunding is an exercise in gratitude. One of the ways to think about your rewards, what's kind of nice about rewards in crowdfunding, is that they're a way of saying thank you to everyone um, and really expressing to them what their support means for you and allowing you to do the work that you really believe. And so we would love to help you do any of those things. If you've come from the starting good, summit recently then there's a special offer at the moment for projects that launch before the end of july where we will actually i personally will be one of your day one supporters and i will give you 20 dollars right when you launch your campaign just as a small token of appreciation for you choosing our site and my admiration for the important work you do and helping you get off to that good start that will help you succeed you should also have received a discount voucher to our online masterclass, which kind of goes even deeper into all these all these factors um, and so I'm happy to, we're right at the end of our time now, but I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes and answer questions if you like. If you're able to add those uh, just in the, in the chat area, that would be great.